We're gonna head down to the shop, light up a little forge and show you how to make a staple. For little jobs like this, this is the perfect size forge for this since we're just using this small rod. It's just built up out of fire brick and it runs off of a propane torch hooked up to a propane tank. So you don't need an extensive forge for doing something like this. If you don't have a forge and can't get this stuff around, you can look online. A ton of the muzzleloading supply shops out there are gonna have the supplies that you need to make the powder horn like this. So don't feel that you need a forge set up like this to make your own powder horn. You can get parts and have them shipped to your door and you don't have to worry about it. While our forge heats up, we're gonna lay out the size of the staple so that we have an idea of what we need to make before we start handling the metal. So I've set my horn here. It's gonna hang this way vertically like this and wrap around my body here. And I've traced around it here with this silver streak pencil to give me an idea of the shape and the size of this horn so I can just draw what my staple is going to be. So I'm just going to make a simple staple. It's just going to have two right angles and be fairly long on the legs out of this 3 16 round rod. We're going to take it to the anvil, square it up, taper each end, square up the center here, and then just try to simply bend it into a staple shape. With this drawn here, I can take just this piece of just scrap wire I've got laying around and I can kind of line it up here and give myself an idea of how big that staple needs to be. So the lengths of the staple legs here are just kind of up to you. This is probably a little too long for the horn that I'm going to be making, but once we get it into this shape, and kind of have the hard work of this done, we can grind and file these ends however we need to. So we can shorten them up some. It's not gonna be a whole lot more work the way this is now. So this gives me an idea. I'm gonna take this over to my anvil so I can kind of have a look at it and get an idea of what I need. And to make it a little easier on myself, I'm actually gonna fold up another one and unfold it so I have an idea of the length of the staple. And then this measurement here is just the amount of material that I need to square up and taper on the ends. So we have our two reference points here to give us an idea of how to do this. We're ready to check on the metal and start forging. On your anvil, a little trick here when you have your wire kind of layout here, what I'm gonna do is just line this up and just make a mark on the face of my anvil here. So that gives me an idea of my length for the staple from here to here. So I can just always quickly measure what I'm doing against the anvil. I don't have to worry about bringing the wire in while I'm trying to shape this. So I'm just about there with the rough forging on this. I'm gonna heat it up one more time and I've got some areas out here on this end that are kind of warped and I'm gonna work on just a nice gentle heat with some gentle hammering to try to even that up a little bit. Then we're gonna cut this off and form it up. So we're not perfectly symmetrical, but I'm not too worried about that. What I'm gonna do next is put this whole thing in the forge and let it heat up. To form this, we're going to try to use this pair of tongs. I don't need a very wide staple, so I'm going to try to grab it with this pair of tongs and grab each tip and bend it around. Then it's going to stray a little bit from the design that we came up with on the bench, but we don't need it to be as wide as we had it. So we're going to try it with this, bending around with these tongs, and then file these ends a little bit sharper so they go into our plug and we should have a finished staple. So here's our staple. We don't have it perfectly even all the way around but we're going to go ahead and nip this off and use our file to sharpen these up a little bit so we can add it to our horn.
Back on the bench now, I'm using a drill bit that's just a touch larger than the points on my horn staple here. My goal here is to drill just enough that the horn staple will go in, but will need forced in. This makes sure the staple's not gonna pop out, and it, this small hole all the way through gives me a chance to make sure that this doesn't split as we're driving the staple in. Now, I'm gonna use a little bit of my five minute epoxy here to make sure that my staple stays in the horn. You can see on my my plug I've covered the wood of the plug with painters tape just so I don't get any rogue epoxy stuck on the plug that I've now finished sanded and oiled I'm just using a little piece of wire here to dab that epoxy into those holes just so we keep our staple sealed in as tight as this was I don't think the epoxy was necessary but for me it's just kind of a nice little safeguard to put in there on an early horn where I have limited experience to seat my staple, I'm using a really small hammer here, and it doesn't sound like it, but I am gently tapping this staple in. I probably took about 15 minutes to get the staple down as far as I did to where I have about a quarter of an inch sticking up between the plug and the staple. This is kind of a final look at it. You can see how that staple works with the rest of the plug. At this point, we have our staple firmly seated, and I've completed a little extra shaping on the neck and the spout of my horn. I got some feedback on it, and um, I was advised to kind of push the shapes a little bit more. So I took a little more material out of the neck, and I made the angle here on the spout a little more extreme. So now that my shaping and my scraping is done, everything's cleaned up, I don't have any rogue file marks showing, I'm ready to put my pins into the plug and we're going to carve a stopper for our spout here and then we're ready then we're done we're ready to go there are several different ways to pin your plug into your horn what i'm going to be using is a few tremont cut nails these are nails that are made in america and they're made on a lot of the same equipment that traditional nails were made on and they look a lot like a traditional nail that would have been common in early America where muzzleloaders were a daily carry. So these are pretty long for my horn. So I'm, what I've done is I've trimmed these in half and I've made up nails that are gonna become pins for my horn. These nails are a simple way to get a nice pin in for your horn and it's still pretty traditional too, which is nice. So on the bench, I'm gonna be supporting my horn with this thick piece of leather that we've been working the horn on for a while. This is just a lot grippier than the bench top. These are my half nail pins that I've made here and here's my bit. So I've marked the bit with a little tape there so I don't go too deep into the plug. And my bit's a little smaller than my pin. Really it's it's smaller than ha more than half of the pin. It's just enough so that we're sure we're not going to crack the plug and we can still get these pins in there. So since we've worked the horn a lot since I put the pin marks, I'm going to set the horn up here the way it would hang and I think it would be nice have a pin there and really kind of frame the, the staple here with two pins. So and I could probably do those a little closer maybe. One there and one there. And just as, as much as the shape of the horn and the contours that you're getting, I think where your pins, where you're putting your pins can kind of become a little bit of the, can become part of the art and the design of the horn too. So. It's good to think about it a little bit as you're picking the places to put your pins. So I've got two here on this side, kind of offset off of the center. I've got a pin, I'll have a pin here and a pin here on either side of the staple. You know, I'm gonna move this one to go a little more in line with the staple there. And then here on this other side, I'm gonna put two more opposite where we have these guys here. I'm going to move this guy over just a touch so it's more in line with that staple, I think. Just kind of smudge that out with our finger. Get that lead out of there. And I'm going to line these up with the line that we scribed on there earlier. Really, we didn't have to scribe this line when we did. I think looking back on it, I would have not scribed the line and worried about that line after I had the plug seated and in. Because I'm using epoxy and not going super traditional with my construction, um, 
because I'm using that epoxy, I think that line could have definitely waited until I had the plug in and I was here. You see here, I have a little bit of a width change just because of the plug seating process that I went through and a little aggressive filing there. And so I don't want to put a pin here where that's really thin, but over here and over here where it really widens back out, we should be good for a pin. So what I'm going to do now is very gently start drilling a hole. And I'm going to start on the back side of the horn, and really the bottom, where nobody, including myself, is going to see it regularly. So in case we mess up this first hole, it's not a very obvious one. A very obvious mistake. Very gentle. I'm going to kind of angle my drill bit a little bit away from the plug, the plug top really. Just so I'm not running a risk of breaking out. Looks like I'm into the wood now. I'm just about there to my mark. So now, because that's my first hole, I'm just going to set the pin just to see how it behaves, I think. That way we get an idea of how the rest of them are going to fit. Now when I cut these, if you're doing like what I did, when I cut these, I used a file to remove any burrs and any sharp edges. So I'll take my little hammer here. No cracks so far, that's good. go and that fits pretty flush. So there you go, that's our first pin in there. Didn't look too bad. Okay. I kind of like the pencil lines on there too. <laughs> kind of gives you a little handmade look. So I'm going to move on to the other holes and I'm going to drill them the same way. When I'm what I'm talking about with that offset is I'm angling the drill like my finger here. So I'm going down and in and not that way I'm not going in and up. I don't want to drill through here and have to put in another patch. If I don't have to, but that's okay, we're learning. For my spout plug, I'm using a piece of walnut off of the same piece that I used for my plug. Using my carving knife, I'm just going to whittle a spout out of this chunk, being inspired by the look and the grain of the wood. I'm leaving a little bit of a bark inclusion there just to add some visual interest. And I really focus on displaying the curl of the grain in this piece of wood because as I apply oil, that's really going to pop. Curly wood grain is kind of a staple in long rifle and muzzle loading culture and adding it to your spout plug here or even the plug at the base of the horn really ties everything together. It may help to file a bevel on your spout tip of the horn just to get a better seal with your plug because our plug is tapered and our hole is straight from the drill. Using a rasp or a file on there gets you more surface area connecting so you're not dripping any powder. And with that, the basic construction of our horn is completed. You could tie this to your bag or make a strap for it and head out into the field now. But you can also, at this point, get ready to start researching scrimshaw designs, adding some more detail to it, or you can just start over and add more detail on another horn.
I hope you've enjoyed the first two parts of this series on basic powder horn construction. As I dive deeper into powder horns and their history and what goes into them, we're going to be bringing you more about the history of the designs that go to the powder horns, as well as the history of powder horns in various locations across early America. You can find the full tutorial to go along with this video series at nmlra.org slash craftsman's corner. We're always adding new classes involving traditional American crafts to our class roster for the year. Head over to nmlra.org slash education to enter your name and an email address to be notified when new traditional craft classes are launched. We'd like to thank you so much for watching and we'll catch you next time.